Section 16 of Don Quixote, Volume 2, that is chapters 29 and 30. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Reynard. Don Quixote, Volume 2 by Miguel de Cervantes Saavedra, translated by John Ormsby, chapters 29 and 30. Chapter 29 Of the Famous Adventure of the Enchanted Bark By stages, as already described, or left undescribed, two days after quitting the grove, Don Quixote and Sancho reached the river Ebro, and the sight of it was a great delight to Don Quixote, as he contemplated and gazed upon the charms of its banks, the clearness of its stream, the gentleness of its current, and the abundance of its crystal waters. And the pleasant view revived a thousand tender thoughts in his mind. Above all, he dwelt upon what he had seen in the cave of Montesinos, for though Master Pedro's ape had told him that of those things part was true, part false, he clung more to their truth than to their falsehood. The very reverse of Sancho, who held them all to be downright lies. As they were thus proceeding, then, they discovered a small boat, without oars or any other gear, that lay at the water's edge, tied to the stem of a tree growing on the bank. Don Quixote looked all round, and seeing nobody, at once, without more ado, dismounted from Rocinante, and bade Sancho get down from Dapple, and tie both beasts securely to the trunk of a poplar or willow that stood there. Sancho asked him the reason of this sudden dismounting and tying. Don Quixote made answer, Thou must know, Sancho, that this bark is plainly and without the possibility of any alternative, calling and inviting me to enter it, and in it go to give aid to some knight or other person of distinction in need of it, who is no doubt in some sore strait. For this is the way of the books of chivalry, and of the enchanters who figure and speak in them. When a knight is involved in some difficulty, from which he cannot be delivered, save by the hand of another knight, though they may be at a distance of two or three thousand leagues or more one from the other, they either take him up on a cloud, or they provide a bark for him to get into, and in less than the twinkling of an eye they carry him where they will and where his help is required. And so, Sancho, this bark is placed here for the same purpose. This is as true as that it is now day, and ere this one passes, tie Dapple and Rocinante together, and then in God's hand be it to guide us. For I would not hold back from embarking, though barefooted friars were to beg me. As that's the case, said Sancho, and your worship chooses to give in to these, I don't know if I may call them absurdities, at every turn, there's nothing for it but to obey and bow the head, bearing in mind the proverb, do as thy master bids me, and sit down to table with him, but for all that, for the sake of easing my conscience, I warn your worship that it is my opinion that this bark is no enchanted one, but belongs to some of the fishermen of the river, for they catch the best shad in the world here. As Sancho said this, he tied the beasts, leaving them to the care and protection of the enchanters, with sorrow enough in his heart. Don Quixote bade him not be uneasy about deserting the animals, for he who would carry themselves over such longinquous roads and regions would take care to feed them. I don't understand that logiquous, said Sancho, nor have I ever heard the word all the days of my life. Longinquous, replied Don Quixote, means far off, but it is no wonder thou dost not understand it, for thou art not bound to know Latin, like some who pretend to know it and don't. Now they are tied, said Sancho. What are we to do next? 
What? said Don Quixote. Cross ourselves and weigh anchor. I mean, embark and cut the moorings by which the bark is held. And the bark began to drift away slowly from the bank. But when Sancho saw himself somewhere about two yards out in the river, he began to tremble and gave himself up for lost. But nothing distressed him more than hearing Dapple bray and seeing Rocinante struggling to get loose. And said he to his master, Dapple is braying in grief at our leaving him, and Rocinante is trying to escape and plunge in after us. O oh, dear friends, peace be with you, and may this madness that is taking us away from you turned into sober sense, bring us back to you. And with this he fell weeping, so bitterly, that Don Quixote said to him, sharply and angrily, What art thou afraid of, cowardly creature? What art thou weeping at, heart of butter paste? Who pursues or molests thee? Thou soul of a tame mouse! What dost thou want, unsatisfied in the very heart of abundance? Art thou, perchance, tramping barefoot over the Riphaean mountains, instead of being seated on a bench like an archduke on the tranquil stream of this pleasant river, from which, in a short space, we shall come out upon the broad sea? But we must have already emerged and gone seven hundred or eight hundred leagues, and if I had here an astrolabe to take the altitude of the pole, I could tell thee how many we have travelled though either I know little, or we have already crossed, or shall shortly cross the equinoctial line, which parts the two opposite poles midway. And when we come to that line your worship speaks of, said Sancho, how far shall we have gone? Very far, said Don Quixote, for of the three hundred and sixty degrees that this terraqueous globe contains, as computed by Ptolemy, the greatest cosmographer known, we shall have travelled one half when we come to the line I spoke of. By God, said Sancho, your worship gives me a nice authority for what you say. Putrid dolly, something transmogrified or whatever it is. Don Quixote laughed at the interpretation Sancho put upon computed and the name of the cosmographer Ptolemy and said he, Thou must know, Sancho, that with the Spaniards and those who embark at Cadiz for the East Indies, one of the signs they have to show them when they have passed the equinoctial line I told thee of, is that the lice die upon everybody on board the ship, and not a single one is left, or to be found in the whole vessel if they gave its weight in gold for it. So, Sancho, thou mayest well pass thy hand down thy thigh, and if thou comest upon anything alive, we shall be no longer in doubt. If not, then we have crossed. I don't believe a bit of it, said Sancho. Still, I'll do as your worship bids me, though I don't know what need there is for trying these experiments, for I can see with my own eyes that we have not moved five yards away from the bank, or shifted two yards from where the animals stand, for there are Rocinante and Dapple, in the very same place where we left them, and, watching a point, as I do now, I swear by all that's good, we are not stirring or moving at the pace of an ant. Try the test I told thee of, Sancho, said Don Quixote, and don't mind any other, for thou knowest nothing about colliers, lines, parallels, zodiacs, ecliptics, poles, solstices, equinoxes, planets, Signs, bearings, the measures of which the celestial and terrestrial spheres are composed. If thou wert acquainted with all these things, or any portion of them, thou wouldst see clearly how many parallels we have cut, what signs we have seen, and what constellations we have left behind, and are now leaving behind. But again I tell thee, feel and hunt, for I am certain that thou art cleaner than a sheet of smooth white paper. Sancho felt, and, passing his hand gently and carefully down to the hollow of his left knee, he looked up at his master and said, Either the test is a false one, 
or we have not come to where your worship says, nor within many leagues of it. Why, how so? asked Don Quixote. Hast thou come upon aught? Aye, and aughts, replied Sancho. And, shaking his fingers, he washed his whole hand in the river, along which the boat was quietly gliding in midstream. Not moved by any occult intelligence, or invisible enchanter, but simply by the current, just there, smooth and gentle. They now came in sight of some large water mills that stood in the middle of the river, and the instant Don Quixote saw them, he cried out, Seest thou there, my friend? There stands the castle or fortress where there is, no doubt, some knight endurance, or ill-used queen, or infanta, or princess, in whose aid I am brought hither. What the devil, city, fortress, or castle is your worship talking about, senor? said Sancho. Don't you see that those are mills that stand in the river to grind corn? Hold thy peace, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Though they look like mills, they are not so. I have already told thee that enchantments transform things, and change their proper shapes. I do not mean to say they really change them from one form into another, but that it seems as though they did, as experience proved in the transformation of Dulcinea, sole refuge of my hopes. By this time, the boat, having reached the middle of the stream, began to move less slowly than hitherto. The millers, belonging to the mills, when they saw the boat coming down the river, and on the point of being sucked in by the draught of the wheels, ran out in haste, several of them with long poles to stop it, and being all mealy, with faces and garments covered with flour, they presented a sinister appearance. They raised loud shouts, crying, Devils of men, where are you going to? Are you mad? Do you want to drown yourselves or dash yourselves to pieces among these wheels? Did I not tell thee, Sancho, said Don Quixote at this, that we had reached the place where I am to show what the might of my arm can do? See what ruffians and villains come out against me. See what monsters oppose me. See what hideous countenances come to frighten us. You shall soon see, scoundrels. And then standing up in the boat, he began in a loud voice to hurl threats at the millers, exclaiming, Ill-conditioned and worse counselled rabble, restore to liberty and freedom the person ye hold endurance in this your fortress or prison, high or low, or of whatever rank or quality he be, for I am Don Quixote of La Mancha, otherwise called the Knight of the Lions, for whom, by the disposition of heaven above, it is reserved to give a happy issue to this adventure. And so saying, he drew his sword, and began making passes in the air at the millers, who hearing, but not understanding all this nonsense, strove to stop the boat, which was now getting into the rushing channel of the wheels. Sancho fell upon his knees, devoutly appealing to heaven to deliver him from such imminent peril, which it did by the activity and quickness of the millers, who, pushing against the boat with their poles, stopped it. Not, however, without upsetting and throwing Don Quixote and Sancho into the water. And lucky it was for Don Quixote that he could swim like a goose, though the weight of his armour carried him twice to the bottom. And had it not been for the millers, who plunged in and hoisted them both out, it would have been Troy Town with the pair of them. As soon as, more drenched than thirsty, they were landed, Sancho went down on his knees, and with clasped hands and eyes raised to heaven, prayed a long and fervent prayer to God, to deliver him evermore from the rash projects and attempts of his master. The fishermen, the owners of the boat, which the mill-wheels had knocked to pieces, now came up, and seeing it smashed, they proceeded to strip Sancho, and to demand payment for it from Don Quixote. But he, with great calmness, just as if nothing had happened him, told the millers and fishermen that he would pay for the bark most cheerfully, on condition they delivered up to him, free and unhurt, the person or persons 
that were endurance in that castle of theirs. What persons, or what castles art thou talking of, madmen? Art thou for carrying off the people who come to grind corn in these mills? That's enough, said Don Quixote to himself. It would be preaching in the desert to attempt by entreaties to induce this rabble to do any virtuous action. In this adventure, two mighty enchanters must have encountered one another, and one frustrates what the other attempts. One provided the bark for me, and the other upset me. God help us, this world is all machinations and schemes at cross-purposes one with the other. I can do no more. And then turning towards the mills, he said aloud, Friends, whoe'er ye be that are immured in that prison, forgive me that, to my misfortune and yours, I cannot deliver you from your misery. This adventure is doubtless reserved and destined for some other night. So saying, he settled with the fisherman, and paid fifty rails for the boat, which Sancho handed to them very much against the grain, saying, With a couple more bark businesses like this, we shall have sunk our whole capital. The fishermen and the millers stood staring in amazement at the two figures, so very different to all appearance from ordinary men, and were wholly unable to make out the drift of the observations and questions Don Quixote addressed to them, and, coming to the conclusion that they were madmen, they left them and betook themselves, the millers to the mills and the fishermen to their huts. Don Quixote and Sancho returned to their beasts and to their life of beasts, and so ended the adventure of the enchanted bark. Chapter 30 Of Don Quixote's Adventure with a Fair Huntress They reached their beasts in low spirits and bad humour enough, knight and squire, Sancho particularly, for with him what touched the stock of money touched his heart, and when any was taken from him, he felt as if he was robbed of the apples of his eyes. In fine, without exchanging a word, they mounted and quitted the famous river, Don Quixote absorbed in thoughts of his love, Sancho in thinking of his advancement, which just then, it seemed to him, he was very far from securing. For, fool as he was, he saw clearly enough that his master's acts were all, or most of them, utterly senseless. And he began to cast about for an opportunity of retiring from his service, and going home some day, without entering into any explanations, or taking any farewell of him. Fortune, however, ordered matters after a fashion very much the opposite of what he contemplated. It so happened that the next day, towards sunset, on coming out of a wood, Don Quixote cast his eyes over a green meadow, and at the far end of it observed some people, and as he drew nearer saw that it was a hawking party. Coming closer, he distinguished among them a lady of graceful mien, on a pure white palfrey, or hackney, caprisoned with green trappings and a silver-mounted side-saddle. The lady was also in green, and so richly and splendidly dressed, that splendour itself seemed personified in her. On her left hand she bore a hawk, a proof to Don Quixote's mind that she must be some great lady, and the mistress of the whole hunting party, which was the fact. So he said to Sancho, Run, Sancho, my son, and say to that lady on the palfrey with the hawk that I, the knight of the lions, kiss the hands of her exalted beauty, and, if her excellence will grant me my leave, I will go and kiss them in person, and place myself at her service, for aught that may be in my power, and her highness may command. And mind, Sancho, how thou speakest, and take care not to thrust in any of thy proverbs into thy message. You've got a likely one here to thrust any in, said Sancho. Leave me alone for that. Why, this is not the first time in my life I have carried messages to high and exalted ladies. Except, 
that thou didst carry to the lady Dulcinea, said Don Quixote. I know not that thou hast carried any other, at least in my service. That is true, replied Sancho, but pledges don't distress a good payer, and in a house where there's plenty supper is soon cooked. I mean, there's no need of telling or warning me about anything, for I'm ready for everything, and know a little of everything. That, I believe, Sancho, said Don Quixote. Go, and good luck to thee, and God speed thee. Sancho went off at top speed, forcing Dapple out of his regular pace, and came to where the fair huntress was standing, and, dismounting, knelt before her and said, Fair lady, that knight that you see there, the knight of the lions by name, is my master, and I am the squire of his, and at home they call me Sancho Panza. This same knight of the lions, who was called not long since the knight of the rueful countenance, sends by me to say may it please your highness to give him leave that, with your permission, approbation, and consent, he may come and carry out his wishes, which are, as he says, and I believe, to serve your exalted loftiness and beauty, and, if you give it, your ladyship will do a thing which will redound to your honour, and he will receive a most distinguished favour and happiness. You have indeed, squire, said the lady, delivered your message with all the formalities such messages require. Rise up, for it is not right that the squire of a knight, so great as he of the rueful countenance, of whom we have heard a great deal here, should remain on his knees. Rise, my friend, and bid your master welcome to the services of myself and the duke, my husband, in a country house we have here. Sancho got up, charmed as much by the beauty of the good lady as by her high-bred air and her courtesy, but, above all, by what she had said about having heard of his master, the knight of the rueful countenance. For if she did not call him knight of the lions, it was no doubt because he had so lately taken the name. Tell me, brother squire, asked the duchess, whose title, however, is not known. This master of yours, is he not one of whom there is a history extant in print, called the ingenious gentleman, Don Quixote of La Mancha, who has for the lady of his heart a certain Dulcinea del Toboso? He is the same, Senora, replied Sancho, and that squire of his who figures, or ought to figure, in the said history under the name of Sancho Panza is myself, unless they have changed me in the cradle, I mean in the press. I am rejoiced at all this, said the Duchess. Go, brother Panza, and tell your master that he is welcome to my estate, and that nothing could happen me that could give me greater pleasure. Sancho returned to his master, mightily pleased with this gratifying answer, and told him all the great lady had said to him, lauding to the skies, in his rustic phrase, her rare beauty, her graceful gaiety, and her courtesy. Don Quixote drew himself up briskly in his saddle, fixed himself in his stirrups, settled his visor, gave Rocinante the spur, and, with an easy bearing, advanced to kiss the hands of the Duchess, who, having sent to summon the Duke, her husband, told him, while Don Quixote was approaching, all about the message, and, as both of them had read the first part of this history, and from it were aware of Don Quixote's crazy turn, they awaited him with the greatest delight and anxiety to make his acquaintance, meaning to fall in with his humour and agree with everything he said, and, so long as he stayed with them, to treat him as a knight-errant, with all the ceremonies usual in the books of chivalry they had read, for they themselves were very fond of them. Don Quixote now came up with his visor raised, and, as he seemed about to dismount, Sancho made haste to go and hold his stirrup for him. But, in getting down off Dapple, he was so unlucky as to hitch his foot in one of the ropes of the pack-saddle in such a way that he was unable to free it, and was left hanging by it with his face and breast to the ground. 
Don Quixote, who was not used to dismount without having the stirrup held, fancying that Sancho had by this time come to hold it for him, threw himself off with a lurch and brought Rocinante's saddle after him, which was no doubt badly girthed. And saddle and he both came to the ground, not without discomfiture to him and abundant curses muttered between his teeth against the unlucky Sancho, who had his foot still in the shackles. The duke ordered his huntsman to go to the help of knight and squire, and they raised Don Quixote, sorely shaken by his fall, and he, limping, advanced as best he could to kneel before the noble pair. This, however, the duke would by no means permit. On the contrary, dismounting from his horse, he went and embraced Don Quixote, saying, I am grieved, Sir Knight of the Rueful Countenance, that your first experience of my ground should have been such an unfortunate one as we have seen. But the carelessness of squires is often the cause of worse accidents. That which has happened me in meeting you, mighty prince, replied Don Quixote, cannot be unfortunate, even if my fall had not stopped short of the depth of the bottomless pit, for the glory of having seen you would have lifted me up and delivered me from it. My squire, God's curse upon him, is better at unloosing his tongue in talking impertinence than in tightening the girths of a saddle to keep it steady. But, however I may be, Alan or raised up, on foot or on horseback, I shall always be at your service and that of my lady the Duchess, your worthy consort, worthy queen of beauty and paramount princess of courtesy. Gently, Signor Don Quixote of La Mancha, said the Duke, where my lady Dona Dulcinea del Toboso is, it is not right that other beauties should be praised. Sancho, by this time released from his entanglement, was standing by, and before his master could answer he said, There is no denying, and it must be maintained, that my lady Dulcinea del Toboso is very beautiful. But the hair jumps up where one least expects it, and I have heard say, that what we call nature is like a potter that makes vessels of clay. And he who makes one fair vessel can as well make two, or three, or a hundred. I say so, because by my faith, my lady, the Duchess, is in no way behind my mistress, the lady Dulcinea del Toboso. Don Quixote turned to the Duchess and said, Your Highness may conceive that never had knight-errant in this world a more talkative or a droller squire than I have, and he will prove the truth of what I say if your highness is pleased to accept of my services for a few days. To which the duchess made answer, That worthy Sancho, his droll, I consider a very good thing, because it is a sign that he is shrewd, for drollery and sprightliness, Signor Don Quixote, as you very well know, do not take up their abode with dull wits. And as good Sancho is droll and sprightly, I here set him down as shrewd. And talkative, added Don Quixote. So much the better, said the Duke, for many droll things cannot be said in few words. But not to lose time in talking, come great knight of the rueful countenance. Of the lions, your highness must say, said Sancho, for there is no rueful countenance, nor any such character now. He of the lions be it, continued the duke. I say, let Sir Knight of the Lions come to a castle of mine, close by, where he shall be given the reception which is due so exalted a personage, and which the Duchess and I are wont to give to all knights errant who come here. By this time, Sancho had fixed and girthed Rocinante's saddle, and Don Quixote, Having got on his back, and the duke mounted a fine horse, they placed the duchess in the middle, and set out for the castle. The duchess desired Sancho to come to her side, for she found infinite enjoyment in listening to his shrewd remarks. Sancho required no pressing, but pushed himself in between them and the duke, who thought it rare good fortune to receive such a knight-errant and such a homely squire in their castle. 
End of Chapter 30 And End of Section 16 Of Don Quixote, Volume 2 Recorded by Reynard